2012's Cosmopolis review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I have loved. This video will have some jokes. We'll get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that's like the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today and or it's different from the source material so it sucks whether you agree with those assessment or not this is not that review and uh, let's see I, I will talk about some of the differences between this and the the book itself I realize this video is long I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time I start the video with a review most likely with zero spoilers if I decide over the course of the video that I want to spoil something I'm gonna verbally warn before I do so hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger as soon as the end of the video itself please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for both movie and book including discussing the ending so the movie is rated R and so will this video be I might swear in this video as they do in the movie so the MPAA rated it R for some strong sexual content including graphic nudity violence and language and yeah so sex nudity violence and gore profanity and frightening and intense scenes are all rated moderate alcohol drugs and smoking are rated mild on the IMDb parents guide and I think it uses the, the R rating well. I am neither opposed to movies, you know, I don't consider myself above movies that are not R rated. You know, I, I love some movies that are R rated, some movies that are like PG or even G rated. I think it's Ideally, you'll want to, to consider, before you start making a movie, what rating makes sense here, what can we do with this rating. You know, th there are G-rated movies that, you know, to some extent there's, a, there's constraints there, there's certain things you can't do, but it does also mean that, you know, potentially you have a larger audience, you have the ability to help influence the minds of children that's a wonderful thing you know unless it's hateful propaganda obviously and with an R rating what that gives you is the freedom to show things that you know are, are otherwise considered unacceptable there's a lot you'll see in an R rated movie that you can't do in like in a public place you know for example, nudity, so as this movie does have, you know, so the, the, yeah, it allows a level of honesty about certain things that, you know, yeah, certain taboo things. This is my first viewing. I just got done watching it five minutes ago before I hit record on the camera so plot yeah it is you know it's set in the present day well 2012 and I'm just gonna quote IMDB here because I think they do quite a good job riding across Manhattan in a stretch limo in order to get a haircut a 20 year old billionaire asset managers day devolves into an odyssey with a cast of characters that start to tear his world apart and this, the, the book itself was written by Don DeLillo. And I have to admit, this is the first thing I did read the book. I, I at least, uh, see, it's been several months since I prepared the notes for this, because originally I was going to do this months and months ago. So I don't remember, I think I may have... I think maybe the last five percent or so I just it's it's a it's not the book is not for everyone I think near the very end it started to to wear on me so I think I skimmed the very very end but other than that I did read the entire book and yeah I I 100 percent understand his appeal and 
you know, it's uh, if I had started reading the book and it was not as research for a David Cronenberg movie, I probably wouldn't have gotten extremely far. But as I was reading it, I was like, ooh, I, I bet Cronenberg is going to do this with that part. And, and, you know, so, yeah, that, that provided a, a significant boost. But, yeah, I would definitely say this is very much one of those cases. You know, sometimes when you watch an adaptation of something, it is important to look at the source more so, or at least as much as, the person doing the adapting. You know, James Gunn, you know, I, I don't, I still haven't, I would like to, I have not watched the movies he made before Guardians of the Galaxy, but if you, yeah, even just looking, you know, his three Guardians of the Galaxy movies, so glad he got to make all three, and then his, you know, Suicide, the, the Suicide Squad, the 2021 movie, you know, yeah, there's some parts where they're they're similar, but there's also some significant differences, and I will admit, I have not read any Guardians of the Galaxy. I have read some, you know, Suicide Squad, and yeah, it was very much, you know, he really got a lot of the essence of the, uh, let's see, I want to say New 52 Suicide Squad. I'm not super... I read comics for years, but I'm not the best at keeping track of the different, but I'm pretty sure it's New 52, you know. And and yeah, the he absolutely he captures a lot of the essence of the New 52 Suicide Squad and the the yeah, so so there's there's some differences and and certainly and you know, some of this is budget, but the you know, yeah, his Guardians and Suicide Squad movies very different from what he made before. You know, I, I did watch his, the, the Dawn of the Dead movie, which he wrote, although, as far as I can tell, some stuff was significantly changed once Zack Snyder started directing. But, yeah, you know, there's there's some major differences there. You know, like, you might not even guess that the, the you know, Dawn of the Dead and The Suicide Squad was written by the same guy, even though they're both R-rated. And that's in part because of what they're, you know, he's adapting the original Dawn of the Dead, an absolute masterpiece, versus, you know, adapting New 52 Suicide Squad, which I love. I'm not saying that's not masterpiece material, but they're extremely different properties. This is very much a case where the name David Cronenberg matters as much as the name Don DeLillo. You know, this is in some ways extremely different from other David Cronenberg and that's something where you know I'm not saying anyone's wrong for not liking this movie a lot of people did not really like this movie and I'm not saying not you know I'm not saying that all of them are just like well I thought this movie was gonna be entertaining and I thought it was kinda of boring there's a certain chunk where that's the case at least a number of them are honest enough to just come around and say it, though I, you know, it's one of those things. Like, I've, I've watched movies that, you know, by the end of watching, I realized I'm not really the intended audience for this, and I try to, to either just not review it, choose simply not to, or to find something to say. Like, I don't think I'm the intended audience, but here's what I picked up, or... You know, this didn't really work for me, but I can appreciate that there was a lot of talent put into this. Because, you know, if you just glance at the scores by a lot of audience members, this looks like it's like The Room or something. You know, something that's actually incompetently made, as what I've gleaned from watching way too many video reviews of, of that movie. You know, this is extremely competently made. It's just not... For everyone, and yeah, you know, some people were there for David Cronenberg, some people were there for the cast, you know, and yeah, like the the you know Robert Pattinson, dude has gone through a lot of re like he keeps changing his his image because of the the different work he he takes, you know, yeah, like. I get it, 2012, this was, let's see, this, 
This movie came out the same year as the last Twilight movie. So yeah, for a lot of people, oh yeah, it's Edward Cullen. I like Edward Cullen, or, you know, I like to hate Edward Cullen. That's how some people felt. So yeah, some people went into this just hoping to hate on this guy that they didn't like because their girlfriend dragged them to, you know, was it four or five movies? You know, I haven't watched any of those. I'd like to think that I would come down on them where Lindsay Ellis ended up coming down on them in, was it like an open letter to the, ah, uh, yeah, I, I forget exactly what her, uh, let's see, Lindsay Ellis Twilight. Her video is called Dear Stephanie Meyer from five years ago. You know, I'd like to think that's where it at least would end up. But yeah, the the um, this is very much a case of of you know Don DeLillo. Like a lot of this is actually just like it took a lot of the dialogue verbatim, which you know I really appreciate. They put a bunch of that in the trailers. So if you watch the you know I. I struggle to understand people who don't watch trailers, but then on the other hand, I get that some trailers give away too much, and I will talk about how that relates to this one later in this video, but this is very much a case where if you watch the trailer, you know, it maybe makes the movie look slightly faster, but it definitely gives you a sense of the dialogue, and the dialogue, like a lot of people, that's where the movie falls apart for them. I don't think that the, the you know being this this is the only Don DeLillo movie, the book that I've read. I don't think that I, I I don't think he's trying to write the way people talk. I think he is intentionally trying to get away from that. And that's the kind of, th you know, the thing with dialogue is sometimes it really feels like, okay, this is how people talk, you know, Quentin Tarantino is quite good at writing and directing dialogue that, you know, okay, maybe it's not quite how people talk, but it's kind of how you wish you sounded when you talk to other people kind of thing. And that has a, you know, the impact of that is that it feels very engaging. It feels, you know, you want to watch these people. You want to listen to them talk kind of thing. You know, some, some people model their appearance on Quentin Tarantino characters. This is very much a case where the, the, the dialogue distinctly is not how people talk in real, real life, which can really lead you to focus on the words spoken and the meaning that is trying to to be put across in it so let's see the yeah the the in an interview david cronenberg said of the movie it's not only a criticism of capitalism nor is the uh, the occupy wall street anti-capitalist or pro-communist it's not inevitable for the extremely rich to become desensitized. And he said that he, there was a review that said the movie is aggressively hard to love. And Cronenberg really loved that review. And I do think that is, that is a wonderful way to put it. It is aggressively hard to love this film. Yes. And Don DeLillo has apparently inspired Brett Easton Ellis. And I have not read any. I, I would love to. I honestly, yeah, at, at some point I'm probably going to sit down and read some Brett Easton Ellis. Some of his, you know, yeah. Um, some of his books have been adapted to films with stuff like American Psycho, The Rules of Attraction, two movies I absolutely love. So I am deeply grateful to Don DeLillo for helping to make those films a, a reality. And let's see the um, 
Right, so yeah. Um, he spends, uh, the, the character Eric Packer, as played by Robert Pattinson, spends a lot of time in this stretch limo. I like that he doesn't, he's not in it from right away. Not, not in the book, not in the movie. And, and uh, right, I don't think I've said yet, in a lot of ways, this is an extremely accurate adaptation. Like he, Cronenberg clearly didn't see this as something that needed significant change. The way that, you know, he changed a lot. Well, let's see, did he write the... I'm not 100% certain if he wrote helped write the screenplay for... A history of violence, but certainly that one is a significant change. So it's not that, you know, Cronenberg, every adaptation of his is a very strict, straight adaptation. Same as he also, you know, he changed a lot for Naked Lunch. But this, like, he, he literally, apparently, like, he copy-pasted the dialogue from the, like, I th let's see, I think he took all the text from the book, copy pasted into to the the screenplay and then changed around everything that wasn't dialogue pretty much you know uh, to make it into a movie script not like change just willy-nilly and let's see yeah so I have some critic quotes one person says I was confused couldn't follow it I'd need a dictionary and the script in front of me no story and no plot and I think that is how a lot of I, I believe that was an actual like critic. I, I forget exactly who said it. That is how a lot of people see. I read the book first. That's a significant aid, and I'm not entirely sure. Like I get, you know, if you're like, ah, oh, it's a movie. I don't want homework. This is a movie. I'm not in school. I just want to be able to sit down for the duration of a movie and get something out of it that I'm glad that I got out of it. I'm not saying that you should have to read the book. I do think that Cronenberg might have, you know, I either read the book or watch it in a way where you can like rewind and rewatch stuff. You know, I especially think like the the book I think every single time that a new character enters the, the, yeah, the book, we get a job title or a few words about how this person relates to Eric, you know. And there were a couple of times in this where, like, because I read, you know, I did read the book, but it was months ago, I was like, who is this guy exactly? Does the... What job does this person have? Because, like, you know, if they're, if they're in the cab, if, if they're in the limo, they have, they're working for Eric in some capacity. But I, I would not have hated if there was, like, a line at it. Like, I think for at least one or two of them, by the end of the conversation between Eric and that person, one of them says, you know, either the guy is going to be like, look, Eric, you hired me to blah 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 and that's what I'm doing for you or Eric will be like dude you are my blah 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 now do it you know kind of thing I would not have hated if each time a new character entered if there was just a brief little added couple of words that told us this is who this is I don't think the movie needed to be as difficult as it ended up being and I don't know if that's Cronenberg failing or succeeding, because he doesn't really want his movies to be super accessible. There's a lot of little decisions he makes across all of his movies, or possibly not all of them, I haven't watched all of them, but all the ones I've watched, there's always something in there where it's like, that was an interesting decision, okay, you don't really, you, this is not supposed to be an easy movie, is it? And, yeah, no story and no plot. Yeah, it kind of just is, you know, Eric talks to someone for a little while, then that person leaves, another person enters, they talk for a while. It's more about 
what is being said, who's saying it, and maybe why, then it is... Yeah, it's not, I, I'm of the opinion that movies don't need to have stories or plots. I think it's important that before you watch a movie, you try to understand what is, you know, un unless you just, if you know, if you like being surprised, but if you're the kind of person who just reacts to movies, who doesn't try to necessarily understand them, but just wants to have, an, you know, wants to enjoy a movie, yeah, you want to look at, you know, who, who is behind this this movie. And the, the yeah, it, it is, it is very much about the things that, yeah, I guess I've pretty much made my point. I gotta get better at realizing when I've sufficiently explained, but yes, this does not really have story or plot. And, let's see, yeah, one critic said, I don't know if DeLillo's fetishized double talk ever works in a visual medium like film, but I can tell you that Robert Pattinson sure as hell isn't up to it, at least not without better direction than this. I gotta say, I, I thought uh, Pattinson did a, a really solid job, and I'm quite impressed with, like, I haven't seen everyone, but I've seen a bunch of these actors in other stuff where they... Yeah, they they their performances and other stuff frequently much more alive, more spirited. Where this is, you know, this is very much a world where everyone is very sedated and subdued a lot of the time. And yeah, you know, these actors were willing to and capable of actually changing that without feeling just like this is the kind of thing where you could easily just end up feeling like okay this is just a half asleep actor and that's not I, I don't think any of them end up like that and another critic said as a writer however Cronenberg fails miserably adapting Don DeLillo's novel of the same name he has a great deal to say about the distance between the rich and the poor and the sense of isolation that exists within a city intentional and unintentional striven for a mist but the commentary is hackneyed and uninteresting. What could have been effectively done in a one act is stretched thin and beaten to death. When the climax is finally reached, even a tour de force performance can't rise above the clumsy dialogue and the 90 minutes that have gone before it. I think there's some some truth to, to that. And this is one of those things, yeah, if, if this had been shorter, but then... These days, you know, Cronenberg does not really make shorts anymore. You know, he did, he, he used to, you know, decades and decades ago. The, the, uh, hold on, not looking for actor, looking for director. There we go. Um, oh, actually, no, never mind. Yes, he did still do some shorts and such around this time. Maybe it was just the the level of attention that a feature film gets that attracted him to to make this as a feature. And you know, certainly there is enough. Like the 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 dialogue is is enough. I, I'm not sure he came up with very much new dialogue for this. I think most of it is from the book. And yeah. Um, I do think that the very, very ending, maybe, maybe it's just me. It, I, um, it could have hit harder, and I think would have, yeah. If, if, because it really is. This is very much. This is a movie that starts with people having philosophical conversations, and you know the, yeah, about themes that I just quoted a critic as describing. And then over the course of it, there's more of those conversations, and yeah, like near the end of the movie, that there's still conversations about that. I don't think it's a problem for a movie to focus very like with with like a laser focus on just a few specific themes throughout. I think that can work really well, especially in the hands of Cronenberg. I think Videodrome does fantastic at that. 
but there are... I suppose it's probably also the fact that Videodrome has some amazing visuals, where this movie, I wouldn't really say that the visuals just, like, completely blew me away the way that, yeah, a lot of his movies have, have visuals that just, you know, I, th I think he may have put a little bit too much stock in the, the dialogue itself. And I think that does end up hurting the, the end product. And another critic said, DeLillo wrote Cosmopolis after 9-11, but his view of a world falling apart has a different context to the one in Cronenberg's film. The anarchic protests that occur throughout the film, including dead rats being hurled, the idea of rats becoming a unit of currency is mentioned a number of times, speaks to our own troubled times with the idea of a member of the rarefied 1% isolated from these scenes in his hermetically sealed cork-lined limo working as a potent metaphor. I think it was very much purposeful that this, you know, the, the, so let's see, the, yeah, the Occupy Wall Street movement was from September 17th to November 15th of 2011. So when they were making this movie, that was definitely something that they, you know, like I, I just quoted Cronenberg himself as saying, it's not that the movie is like exclusively exclusively against. Hold on, I uh, did I get that right? No, wait. Yeah, he said that Occupy Wall Street is not, you know, anti-capitalist and pro-communist. You know, so so yeah, this was very much a case. Um, let's see if we can get yes, because this was film. Oh, hold on, right. This was filmed before Occupy Wall Street, but then, you know, there's a lot of people who saw something like Occupy Wall Street coming. It was, you know, it didn't materialize from one second to the next. It, it you know, there was a sense in the air. And, let's see... And, yes, one more critic quote about the script. When those themes are made clear about the way capitalism destroys the masses to benefit the few and dehumanizes those who control the wealth of others, Cosmopolis is more than just all right. Unfortunately, it seldom does that. And, yeah, that is also definitely an, an issue with it. You know, this is one of those movies where I think you want to consider it more an experience and just, yeah, try to soak up all the... Like, if this movie was a third longer than it is, I would definitely be saying this is just plain excessive. You cannot expect... Not in the year 2012. You cannot expect people to absorb this much. You know... And, and this is also the sort of thing, you know, I was going to say, you know, Kubrick could maybe, Kubrick would have made a lot of it much more visual. You know, the Kubrick, R.I.P., you know, clearly really awful to have to work for, but, you know, some of the, the movies that came out of it, absolute masterpieces, he was very good at also having visuals to, to break up so it wasn't just a lot of dialogue. The dude liked dialogue, for sure. There's some very talk-heavy movies in his catalog, but, yeah, this this would definitely have benefited from some of some of that. And, yeah, I, I wouldn't really say that this is a movie that is all that much about the plot twists, I've seen some people say they were unhappy with the plot twists, and I, I get that. I, I've, yeah, what I would say is I don't think that's really what is, yeah, it's not really the focus. There is something in this, at least one thing in this, that could be referred to as a plot twist, but it's really not, you know, 
yeah, it's not the kind of, it's not the, the goal. And let's see. Yeah, so I have been a fan of David Cronenberg since at least the early 2000s. I've watched every movie of his that I could get a copy of, ranking all of the all of the ones I've watched worst to best keep other than this one I will update the ranking with where I place this at the very end of the review right before I get into spoilers so you know if that's what you're especially if you want to hear that before you hear the rest of you you know feel free to skip back and forth but yeah so the brood the dead zone naked lunch eastern promises scanners spider history of violence Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, Videodrome. That's right, in my opinion, Fly Defeat Spider, not the other way around. And yeah, like every Cronenberg film I've just mentioned having watched, this doesn't quite take place in the real world. And if you go into it expecting a documentary, expecting it to purely, okay, this is, I'm about to sit and watch something that could happen in the real world, you are going to be extremely frustrated. And that, again, comes across in, in some reviews. Like, so, it's, I, th I think the, I think it's a more interesting conversation to be having about this movie is if the themes quite have the, the impact that they should, and if they should have been handled more in visuals than in dialogue, than just saying, you know, well, this isn't, this is not happening in reality. No, it absolutely is not, and is not meant to. And, you know, if you only watch movies that are set in reality, you are missing out on so much amazing cinema. And, yeah, Cronenberg does not want us to know if what is happening is good or bad, if the characters are good or evil. He wants us to think about these things and make up our own minds about it. And, yeah, some, some s critic quotes about other Cronenberg material that I thought, yeah, I, I quote these in most of my Cronenberg reviews. All Cronenberg films are about identity. If you're looking for recurring themes that run throughout, through Cronenberg's work, there are few regularly revisited than the idea of body modifications and how modern technology causes people to undergo physical changes that reflect either their true identities or the way they want the world to perceive them. This particular movie does not really have, you know, intentional body modification the way some of the others do, but the other is very true. And Cronenberg thinks that there's comedy in all of his movies, and is happy with how funny they are, which, yeah, quite, yeah, it's it's a very dry sense of humor for sure. And uh, yeah, so some critic quotes about the direction. One person said, "It's like the car is a spaceship. The film only works on the cerebral level. I can't engage with the characters on the emotional level." And this is very true, and that's, again, something where, yeah, you know, if that's okay with you, the movie might work for you. If it's not, it almost definitely won't. Another critic said, the movie isn't for everyone, but if it grabs you, prepare for it to stick in your head for days. And that was definitely true for me with the book. Obviously a little too early to say about the, the movie itself, but I think there's a pretty good chance, yes. DeLillo's brilliant analysis of the destructive power of wealth that took such seductive hold on page has a tough time gaining traction on screen. Let's see. When one user reviewer gave it an 8 out of 10 said, How sweet the downwards here are. Right, this is, yeah, so they go by The Waking Hour, and I think this is an IMDb user review. I can't re recall a film that so tweaked people, who may be nice enough most of the time, but are utter drips and drabs when their emotions and presumptions and every thought in the craniums of the one-star reviews and the deliciously negative comments section, is one presumed, are so nakedly uncatered to off. 
There are others who grok what I'm saying, help put a pack of metaphorical matches in between the toes of these eyes open but asleep boars and light it so that they may bicycle to the sky of a novel thought and an experienced emotion. As artificial, unrealistic, and absurd as the novel it closely follows, I like this very much. And that's again another thing. Like some of the reviews here are very, very Karen, very. I want to talk to your manager. This product did not deliver what I bought it for, and the the you know this poor service employee trying to explain, ma'am, you bought the wrong thing. Does this come across as misogynistic? I don't mean it to be. I, what's a what's a male Karen? Did we ever? Because uh, I don't mean it as a thing on women. The let's see, Ken Terry or Greg. This is very Ken Terry or Greg, you know, the, the, yeah, underpaid, you know, really put upon service worker trying to say, look, Ken Terry or Greg, I didn't catch it. You bought the wrong thing. You should have read the package properly. Nobody is at fault here but yourself. You, I don't know what you expected is what he would like to be saying, but he'll probably try to, try to couch it in some kind of, you know. Yeah, this is this is not. I uh, I really hate people who just like. Well, you know, this is a capitalist system. So if I pay for something, it has to do exactly what I want it to. But then don't go to a thing that didn't like. I don't know how you got the idea that a Cronenberg adaptation of a Don DeLillo novel would deliver something other than what you like. Again. There are criticisms to be made of this. I do think that, for example, the idea of, you know, maybe this just works better on the page than on the screen. And maybe, you know, it's it's much too long, even though overall the film isn't super long. You know, but to just say, well, I thought this was boring. Well, would, well did you think the book was boring also? Have you watched other Cronenberg? And again, just... Some of these people don't even bring that up, don't even mention, like, they'll, they'll maybe say, oh, you know, I kind of thought this actor was always fun. Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to go off on a thing about people who watch movies and shows just for the cast and don't pay attention to who's writing and directing and then go on to say, well, you know, usually when I watch something that these people are in, I really love it, but here, you know, look at who's behind it. Anyway, look at who's behind the camera, not only who's in front. And, yeah, one critic said, Cosmopolis is about disconnection. Its lens is a microscope's lens, and its director is an alien anthropologist. The sex is as clinical as the interactions. The most disturbing scene in a film, in a film full of them is a quick shot of someone's hand touching Eric's foot as she slithers on the floor of his limo immediately post-sex. And yeah, it, it really is just, I, I can't put into words exactly why, but it's so true. Just, yeah. And I think, yeah, the, the lens is a microscope's lens, and the director is an alien anthropologist. I think that absolutely perfectly describes what we have here. And I really think that is the the... Like, like I said, I, I would have liked more visual demonstration. There is some really great stuff. I, th I think most of it is pretty much directly from the, the book. But, you know, but, yeah, the, the alien anthropologist is the, the right way to approach this. Because it very much is, like, if you met Eric Packer in real life, you would not be able to have a natural conversation with him and that's part of the point. You know, it's a snapshot of a world that, you know, it doesn't quite exist like this in the real world, but there are people very much like Eric Pack, or there are, you know, every so often, you know, some of the time, rich people are able to, to pass as, you know, relatable, as, as someone who hasn't completely lost the plot, but... Yeah, a lot of, you know, every so often, something will slip through. They'll they'll mention something, 
And all the rest of us are like, what the fuck? Why would you think that? Why would you say that? In what universe, where in the multiverse is that an okay thing to think, much less say? What is wrong with you? And every pack, you know, and, and yeah, imagine spending over an hour and a half with someone like that. He's the protagonist. He's the main character. He's in a lot of this movie. I'm not going to give away if it's the entire thing, but yeah, you know, it's it's not a good time, but it does, it is very honest. And I do think it is extremely important that we are critical of the wealthy. Like, we have to keep in mind, for as long as there's been capitalism, and really, it, yeah, further back, yeah, when we had, you know, I suppose some places still do have, like, kings and such, but, you know, back when that was the norm, back when every country had a king, you know, yeah, back then, of course there were poor people who were like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like, and for a very long time, there would be all these fictions told about them to help calm the rabble down. You know, no, 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 listen, the king is ordained by God. If you are against the king, you are against the church, and that means we burn you. You know, so so it's that kind of thing, and and you know, in more recent decades, finally we're able to criticize the rich and powerful, and I don't know if this is the very best of them, but I do think it is quite interesting. A lot of these critiques make the the very rich person that we're supposed to find really ridiculous an antagonist, not the protagonist. And I suppose an argument could be made that he he's, he's definitely an antagonistic force here. But he is someone that we spend a lot of movie time with. And that really does... Like, we're seeing some of his most private moments. We see him go to the bathroom. We see him have sex. We see him talking to his wife. You know, all of these really, really personal things. And throughout this... Like, the movie is careful to make it clear that though you are seeing him do things that you yourself do in your know, day-to-day life, he is not someone, that, you know, that you can necessarily relate to. You know, his his world is beyond ours. You cannot relate to him or the people who work for him. The people who work for him are used to him. If you encountered one of them in real life, you also would not be able to have an actual conversation. You know, every so often a character will say, Eric, what what are you saying? What are you doing? You know, but a lot of the time they kind of just go along with it. Some of them are paid well enough to, some of them are just like resigned to it, you know, but this is very much a glimpse into a world that really helps us appreciate no the rich are not our betters they are not they don't know better they are not more capable they a lot of them are rich because they were born into wealth you know they inherited or they were born into a position where they could get an education and get chances that the rest of us can't and that a lot of the time, that's why they're rich. And the people who work themselves up from the very bottom, along the way, took advantage of other people. That's why they're rich. You can't amass wealth without taking advantage of someone else. And, yeah, this is, you know, it's important that we realize that. So, you know, before you start solving a problem, you have to be certain about the problem. You know, if you're, like, you know, well, like... I, the, the, you know, when I flick the light switch, the light doesn't come on. Well, is it the bulb? Is it the wires? You know, it could be various things. Like, you can, you can replace the bulb a hundred times. It's not going to work if it's the wiring, you know. So, yeah, it is a problem that rich people have as much power and can ruin so many lives with so little, you know, doing so little. You know, it should be there should be a lot of things in the way you know I don't think it'll be ever be completely impossible for an individual or at least a group to ruin someone else's life
but it should not come easy. It should be an extremely difficult process deterring people from doing it on purpose and preventing it from happening by accident. You know, you catch it along the way, ideally. Once we've realized that that's the problem, we can start talking about, well, you know, we have to tax them more. We have to take, you know, there, there are laws that have to be adjusted so that rich people, you know, ah, I, I'm afraid I forgot to, to write it down, but there was a really excellent quote I heard a couple of days ago. I'm, I'm afraid I forgot to note who, but someone said, of, um, if you get a fine for doing something wrong, that just means that it's legal for the rich to do it, you know. Those laws have to be changed, you know, the money has to be redistributed, and obviously a lot of it should go to taking care of people who currently have very little, you know. And, yeah, I think that this movie is, you know, I, I don't know if it ended up having that effect, but I think it at least had the the potential to. And I think, I, I personally hold in high regard works that are at least trying to do the right thing. There are so many movies that are all about, no, nope, if someone's rich, what are you going to do? They're, they're just better than you. If they say that you should go and die... What are you gonna do? They're right. You know, you can't fault them for being right, you know, and and just I'm so glad that we're finally making a lot of movies that are much more critical of that sort of thing. And you know, I I saw a video, I guess by now it's been a month or more. Someone pointed out that when ah crap, what's it called again? It is yeah, let's see. There was a... This is going to take too long. Um, the the Maybe I'll think of it as I'm talking about. But, yeah, it, it's a movie about, like, yeah, a rich person taking advantage of, of poor people. And when it was first released, it was actually considered, like communist propaganda and they let's see they at least tried I think they even succeeded yes the movie is called it's a wonderful life from 1946 I forget if they succeeded but they definitely tried to have the people behind it blacklisted for you know criticizing rich people that's communism you know it's, look one second you're saying, you know, maybe rich people shouldn't get to ruin other people's lives. The next second, we're all in, in line for bread. You know, it's completely ridiculous. And, yeah, you know, today you can make a movie like that without it just being, yeah, without it ruining careers. You know, the... the both Cronen, yeah, Cronenberg as well as the cast have worked multiple times in the 13, uh, 11, wow, did I not get enough sleep last night? 11 years since this came out. You know, I, I'm not sure that it ruined any of, of these people. I've, I feel like, yeah, I've seen most of these people in, in stuff that came out since. So, uh, right, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but... The ending definitely fits what came before. Some people, some people love the ending. Some people hate the ending. I lean towards loving it. I definitely don't hate it. I, I th I'm going to try to have made up my mind about how I feel about the ending before I finish the video, before the end of the the spoiler thoughts sections, which you know. That's the only place of this video I'm gonna dis I'm gonna talk about the ending in detail anyway. And yeah, so I recommend reading or listening through the original book of the same title if you like the film and vice versa. You know, if you like the original book, yeah, I I, I do recommend the movie. I would say, you know, to try not to be too 
you know, I, I don't think it completely lives up to the, the book in, in every way. And th this is one of those cases where the, the length of the book itself really does fit well for the length of a movie. You know, it was, it, it's, it doesn't happen a huge amount of the time with, with novels. A, a lot of novels that were adapted into film, they had to, you know, change stuff, trim out a bunch of stuff. But here, yeah, they actually do... The, the I'm not going to give away whether, you know, certain major plot points... When I get to the spoiler sections, I'll talk about those. But certainly a lot of the dialogue, that I will say. And... Let's see... Right, so, yeah, that brings us to the characters. So, yeah, um, this is only the second thing I see Robert Pattinson in. Um, I loved him in Tenet, and I do think that he does really well here. You know, I, I would say that overall Tenet is definitely, like, seeing him in Tenet makes me want to see him in more stuff. Here, I don't, I don't know that he completely sold, yeah, and Cronenberg must have loved working with him, or his performance, because he brought him back for the next movie he made, Maps to the Stars, which, unfortunately, right now I don't have access to, I would like to watch it, and Cronenberg is a director who has worked only once each with a lot of incredibly talented stars, but he brought back Pattinson like he did Mortensen, so... Yeah, there's definitely, and, and, you know, he and Mortensen are incredible together, you know. And, let's see, yeah, so, as alluded to earlier, I know some people hate him for the Twilight movies, none of which I've watched, probably won't watch them, but since the Twilight movies, he's gone for a lot of indie movies, rather than trying to coast on his conventionally attractive looks and relative success, you know, there were a lot of people who hated those movies, but there's also people who, you know, yeah, you know, there are there are people who thought, oh, you know, he, he looks incredible, and they would go to pretty much any movie that he appeared in. So, yeah, he could have chosen to just go for that, you know, the um, comparatively, I don't want to, like, be too hard on him, because I don't. I'm not sure I've heard anything that suggests that he's actually, like, a bad person in real life, and I do think that matters substantially more than not being the best actor in the world, but Taylor Lautner, you know, yeah, some, some a lot of people thought he was just amazing in the, the yeah, that he looked amazing in, in Twilight, yeah, apparently he's not, like, the best actor, and he, yeah, so, you know, it could, I, it could easily, you know, not everyone recovered that well from, from Twilight. I did think he was amazing in Scream Queens. I, I think that's also in part because there he's also not quite, it's not, he's not really that natural or, or, like, yeah, it's it's. I th I think he's really great for that role at least, and I don't really. Bl <laughs> the only other thing I've seen him in is is Shark Boy and Lava Girl. One, it's pretty amazing that they made more than one of those. But yeah, um, I don't really blame. Him. He was like he was like 12, 13 years old at the time, you know. So. But, no, like, um, let's see, yeah, both with Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart, you know, they've proven they're not interested in being defined by the Twilight movies. And I think that matters tremendously, you know. I, I think we should give, you know, it's also, like, um, I had seen her in stuff that, like, you know, I I already knew that she was really talented. 
and let's see. You know, I do think that it makes sense to to, you know, if someone if someone really comes across as though they're just coasting, they don't really want to make an effort, you know, as as an actor. Yeah, like I would say, I mean, there's people who would kill to have the chances you have. Maybe step out of the way and let someone who does care about this kind of thing, you know. But someone who's been in a bad movie or something, you know, if they're determined to prove that they can do better, I really think we should give them a chance. So, the, yeah, various critic quotes about Pattinson and the character Eric. Uh, yeah, he's like an alien, inhuman, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. And... Let's see. One right, right, yeah. I do think this is a, a pretty good. So, so yeah. One critic said, "Is a disappointing performance, especially working with Cronenberg, who's usually terrific with casting choices. Eric should be this deteriorating shell of a man, accepting punishment from those out to harm and humiliate him. Yet Pattinson plays every scene with the same robotic expression, lacking the thespian integrity required to communicate doomsday in the eyes of a demon." That is true. I I can imagine he has improved since because I hear amazing things about some of his more recent performances. Um, oh, right. Holy crap. How did I forget? Yeah. I love him in The Batman. Holy crap. Did I write this before watching The Batman? Is that how old this these notes are? My god. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. Anyway. Yes, I hear great things about his performance in The Lighthouse, and I do think, you know, some people were like, oh, but this Bruce Wayne is just like the Batman. Yeah, that's part of the point. Like, he's he's really not good at putting on the facade yet. Now, if you want to say, oh, well, how can people not see through it? I think an argument could, be, you know, that might be, wow, I just realized this movie's actually rated low. On IMDb, this Cosmopolis has a 5.1 out of 10. Twilight 1 has a 5.3. So that kind of tells you that, yeah, maybe people are being a little... Anyway, yeah. Um, I hear great things about him in The Lighthouse, where he is... Is he the protagonist, or one of the protagonists, at least, and... Yeah, you know, I've that's apparently also a very difficult performance, but one that he really nailed. So, yeah, I I think maybe you know maybe he watched the movie and was like, ah, I could have been better, and and really, you know, yeah, improved. And let's see. And yeah, another critic said, in the book, Eric is knowledgeable. He knows the Latin name of the honey locust tree. He makes references to Freud and Einstein. He seems very intelligent and aware. He has depth. Cronenberg's Eric is venal and static. This is low-lighted by the limitations of the actor. And that is true. And it's, I, I don't know why, because Cronenberg himself is very intellectual you know some some people find it frustrating that he you know they're like come on dude I just want to watch you make heads blow up come st stop being such a smarty pants so I actually don't know why it it ended up like that but uh, yeah I mean some of it definitely is yeah maybe maybe Cronenberg didn't realize that this would be the effect but yeah he you know yeah the 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 kind of stuff that is in in books, like in internal monologue kind of stuff, you know, there there are some movies that turn it into voiceover narration. This does not do that, and so yeah, we lose some of his interior life and only get what he says to other people, and that does definitely put some limitations. Yeah, Sarah Gadon plays Elise Parker, Eric's wife, and. Let's see. Yeah, and and the 
yeah, in both book and movie, they barely appear to know each other, like, r realizing stuff like eye color, what they do for a living, you know, stuff you should already know about your spouse. Now, they're not, they're not engaged, this is not the second date, they're married, you know, they, they say at one point, we've been married for weeks or something like that, you know, but they, they don't know, you know, and, and another character actually compares it to, like, one of the, the kind of marriages that they would do, you know, because, yeah, both of them are from rich families, so it's compared to one of those marriages where they're bringing two powerful families together, arranged marriages kind of thing. And, yeah, in his internal monologue in the book, he thinks to himself that her poetry sucks, but he likes her appearance, and that, again, does not come through in the movie. Kevin Durand plays Torval, Eric's chief of security, and, yeah, it was very, like, I don't think I've ever seen Kevin Durand subdued before. Like, he's he's usually extremely intense, you know, and I love him for it. I, I don't, I've never been unhappy with with performance of his. I've always really enjoyed, you know, but yeah, we're, we're used to seeing him, like, kicking ass, and, 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 and for this, yeah, it, but, you know, he, he has the presence, not, not every single, like, really big, you know, muscular actor can actually get across the sense of, you know, I can fuck you up with, you know, the tiniest little, you know, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even have to think. It would just be like that, just and nothing, you know. But Kevin Duran has it, and yeah, works quite well here. And yeah, I don't think I really have too much else to say about the cast. Um, so let's move on. So yes, the, the dialogue, yeah, I, uh, despite this film not being super well received, there are 47 entries in the IMDb quote section. I would definitely say all of them are quite interesting. You know, there, there are movies that have higher ratings than this, that have less entries, even some of them have, with great dialogue. And, yeah, so, some critic quotes. Um, some say that it's got incomprehensible dialogue, and it is, like, I, I always, I, if, whenever possible, which most of the time, is most of the time, I watch stuff with subtitles, even when I speak the language fluently. Yeah, this is one of those cases where I would say, even if you don't usually... Yeah, put on subtitles if if you can because it's it helps tremendously. One person said it uses arcane meter. Another says the rapid dialogue is dry and mannered like a David Mamet play. The whole movie sounds like a poem because it is. The characters are inside out. Instead of hearing their boasts, we hear their thoughts. And so and if you don't get that point, I can see how you would think that this is a bad movie. And yeah, so the this was shot by Peter Sushitsky. He's the cinematographer. You know, he's worked with Cronenberg other times. Yeah, a bunch of other times. And yeah, so some critic quotes. Well shot, a lot of long takes, it felt like a stage play, true. There's virtually no story, and Kronberg's visual scheme is cold and claustrophobic. In a series of long takes, let's see, oh, hmm, yeah, one sequence is over 22 minutes long, and let's see, Right, and yeah, at least one part has, uh, let's, yeah, 
direct quote, continuing Cronenberg's favoring of focus in depth from a dangerous method. The cinematography is, of course, what Cronenberg got us used to. You can't say it's not brilliantly shot, shot, making the most of minimalist decor. The interior of a car, no matter how nerdy, futuristic, and flu full of blue dials and screens, is something extremely constricting in terms of camera angles and set definition. Limiting, yes, but cleverly used throughout so that the angles and close viewpoints needed in the car are used on the outside, giving the whole film a nice unity of construction. And of course, maximizing the shock let's see, of certain scenes. Let's go with that. And this was edited by Ronald Sanders, who also has worked with Cronenberg on a bunch of other stuff. And yeah, I, I really appreciate the decision to, to leave a lot of these long takes, you know, whilst breaking up other... Yeah, you know, the, you have some scenes that have this, you know, very typical kind of, you know, it's, it's a conversation between two people, so... You film one person when they say something, then you go to the other person to see their reaction and or response kind of thing. And, yeah, you know, it it's used quite well. I, I really appreciate that not every scene was handled the exact same way because it wouldn't really have have worked. And this was made on a budget of $20.5 million, and the box office was only $7.1 million. So, yeah, one of Cronenberg's numerous, you know, uh, box office bombs. And this was filmed... Let's see. Yeah, largely in. Oh, actually, looks. No, no, yeah. Largely in Toronto. A little bit in New York as well. And. Yeah, a lot of it is, is studio. They do use some. You know, physical location, which. Locations, which lends it increased authenticity the music is by Howard Shore who has also worked with Cronenberg elsewhere and let's see yeah um, some of the soundtrack is here on YouTube free to listen to so I did I recommend you do so there's 44 minutes worth you know, it's excellent, some of it unnerving, off-putting, grating in a way it's somewhat similar to the otherworld noisy music of Silent Hill 1. And one critic describes it as Moby-like soundtrack is good at mood building, which is very true. And yeah, again, you know, like so many other aspects of this film, like the dialogue and the acting and the, the set, the setting, it kind of holds you at arm's length. You know, you're not supposed to really be comfortable here. And that's that's a big part of the point. And again, I, I would I would have a problem with that if this movie was much longer. I would be saying this is just exhausting, you know. But with the length that it has, I think that, yeah, it was the, the right design the right choice wow I may need more sleep this movie is uh, there we go. 99 minutes without end credits and 105 minutes with and yeah it's it's very much like there are a number of Cronenberg films that are not very long that are you know a hundred minutes or less He's very good at making movies around that length without making them feel short. I've seen some people say, you know, oh, he makes short-ish movies, you know, 
by today's standards, 105 minutes is not particularly long. You know, there were, you know, there were movies from 2012. I think, let's see, 2012, that was the same year as the first Avengers movie. I'm pretty sure that one's like two and a half. Yeah, 223. You know, although some of that might be end credits. But, yeah, you know, yeah. He makes short-ish movies. Some people think that they're boring, even though they are. You know, I, I would definitely say that this one, I wasn't as invested by the end as I was at the very start. You know, which, yeah, as I as I mentioned, I think more visual exploration of the metaphors and themes would have done a lot. And, yeah, um, the best element of this is probably the modern Cronenberg and yeah the worst aspect is the 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 fact that it doesn't have more of the of the visuals what little there is is excellent they they put some of the best visuals in the in the trailers which might have you thinking that they're just showing you a tiny little bit of there's going to be much more ultimately there isn't that much more and let's see yeah so the that about brings us to yes so there are two trailers from the yeah from when the movie came out and i would say both of them give at least a little bit too much away but it is also one of those things where you get a decent sense, you especially, you know, the, the dialogue you, you get a, a sense of. And the, the, uh, I think that might be about, yeah, um, the cover and poster do not give too much away and to an extent give you a, uh, decent idea of what the movie is like. On Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 66% on the tomato meter, making it fresh, not certified fresh. The audience score is only 31%, based on more than 25,000 ratings. Uh, let's see. So, so yeah, from users, it's rotten. The consensus, though some may find it cold and didactic, Cosmopolis benefits from David Cronenberg's precise direction, resulting in a psychologically complex adaptation of Don DeLillo's novel. Now, the critic score is based on 188 reviews. The average rating is 6.10 out of 10. 125 of them are fresh. And from audiences, the average rating is 2.5 out of 5. And, you know, anything below a 3.5 out of 5 is considered a down vote. And, and yeah, I, I do, th you know, could be lower, could be, you know, the average rating does basically take into account that there are at least aspects of it that are well made that can be appreciated even if you end up not liking the movie as a whole and on Metacritic it has let's see the, there we go it has a 58 out of 100 from critics based on 35 critic reviews and a 5.3 from users so that they they roughly agree now the let's see there are uh, yeah the the 35 critic reviewers 57% gave it positive 34% gave it mixed 9% gave it negative <laughs> one person said that the climax is as dull as reading the dictionary of a language you do not speak. Yeah. And 
I wouldn't go quite that far, but I there's definitely some truth. And huh, one person says Cosmopolis easily trumps to roam with love as the biggest disappointment of 2012 from an established director. And the last of the negative critic reviewers on Metacritic say, said vapid claustrophobic drama. And see, that is, I definitely, yeah, describing it as vapid, that is a criticism that makes significantly more sense than boring to me. Anyway, there are, of, right, of the 34 user reviews, 40% gave it positive, 29% gave it mixed, and 31% gave it negative. And... Right. There's at least some people who really did not like it. You know, one one negative review from a user on Metacritic. Cronenberg is back to his obscure, out there ways, but with this movie, we just get a dull and exhaustive mess. You know, it's it's fine to not like it, but just at least say, are you? Do you know this director? Do you know what they usually do? Because it kind of matters if it. Yeah. You know, on the other end of the spectrum, one person said, The most boring I have movie I had ever seen. There is not content. Nothing is interesting. I almost sleep watching this. Is just blah 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 inside a limo. All the movie talking about something we don't care is just boring. Fuck me. Um yes, moving on. On IMDB. So yeah, I mentioned, yeah, it has a 5.1 out of 10 based on 50,000 ratings, 16.4% gave it 5, 15.3 gave it 6, 12.9 gave it 7, 12.0 gave it 4, 10.7 gave it 1, 8.4 gave it 8, 8.1 gave it 3, 6.5 gave it 2, 6.0 gave it 10, 3.8 gave it 9. So... Yeah, this does not have a sizable fan contingent on IMDb. And there are 243 IMDb user reviews, or 191, if you hide the spoilers. And I read the... Oh, that's right, yeah, I did end up reading all of the spoilers. <laughs> Maybe that's part of why I'm so annoyed by negative reviews of it that don't really engage with it much at all. Anyway, um, yeah, and of the 100 voted the most useful, 19 gave it 1 out of 10, 9 gave it 2, 6 gave it 3, 7 gave it 4, 6 gave it 5, another 6 gave it 6, yet another 6 gave it 7, 18 gave it 8, 12 gave it 9, and 9 gave it 10. So yeah, the there are some at least, yeah, some people did really love it. And, yeah, there are 381 links in the IMDb external reviews section. Only 154 of them are n not dead links and are in English. So, yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of sites that went down in these 11 years. And... So the, yeah, this is not very heavy on special effects, but what there is tends to be quite good. There are, I don't know how much I want to give away, but yeah, there are some practical effects, as per usual, for for Cronenberg. There's at least one thing that must have been a, a visual effect of of some kind but it was very convincing and yeah uh, if you watch Cronenberg in part for you know the the gore and violence and you know no shame that's that is how I started out you know it was when I was a teenager I watched a lot of movies with a lot of gore and violence 
and Cronenberg, you know, yeah, really, let's see, Cronenberg and John Carpenter were the ones where I actually stuck around after I was no longer particularly interested in, in violence and gore because there was more to their movies than than that, but there's a lot of movies that, yeah. This is not very violence and gore heavy, especially compared to some of his, you know, yeah, some of the stuff that he's especially known for, like Videodrome and the Fly. You know, there is a little bit more violence and gore than in some of the other, you know, more recent of, of his work, like Spider, for example, does not have very much at all. And... Yeah, there is some nudity. The, the sex is very, like, detached and not really, you know, it's not erotic, really. Which, yeah, you know, fits the... the what the movie is going for and also is about what we expect from Cronenberg's and yeah um, I rate this n seven life-changing car rides out of ten and yeah it would be higher if more visuals it would be lower if not for the dialogue and the camera work and just how consistent this world is. This is, you know, Cronenberg is one of the people who can get away with making something this, like, just, what's the word? It is completely unashamed of its identity. You know, I, I watch... These days, a lot of the most recent movies I watch, you know, if I'm going to a movie theater, it's usually for a comic book adaptation. And in a lot of those, there's clear, like, anxiety from the studio about, ah, uh, do we want to go that long without a joke? Ooh, is this merchandisable? And, and stuff like that. And, yeah, with this movie, there's just no, like, there's no sense of fear of going too long without a joke, of of a moment being truly felt. You know, this movie will make you feel things that you're not going to like, and that's, you know, yeah, if you're not interested in that, then this is not a movie for you. I definitely do think that the movie holds up. I could imagine... I don't know for sure, but I could imagine some people might go back to this and, like, you know, appreciate it more. You know, maybe not today, but in, in years to come, you know, we are gradually seeing more and more, like, just incontrovertible evidence that some of the richest people in the world, just, they, they have no idea. They, they have no... It's like they don't live on Earth. It's like everything... Like, Elon Musk has literally said that, he, that he, he's not certain that this isn't all a simulation. And, yeah, then, you know, it starts to make more sense that he's behaving the way he is. You know, if he legitimately isn't convinced that he's living in reality and certainly behave... Yeah, a lot of them, they don't... They don't it doesn't feel like they're living in reality. And, you know, yeah... Like, if this movie came out, you know, today, people would be like, oh, you know, Eric, he's, you know, there's some, some of the things that Eric does in this movie are very reminiscent of things that, er, that Elon Musk has said and done recently. You know, they, basically the movie understood well enough what the world is like for rich people to be able to, you know, I don't know if we want to use the word predict, but like, I, I don't know if they were, they knew that it would actually happen, but they were just saying, you know, it's almost like this, and then it did end up happening. 
And I definitely do think that it deserved better. At least deserved for more of the conversation from user reviews to actually focus on what is the movie trying to do. Not just, I'm the hundredth person to realize this movie is boring, so I'm going to say that it's boring instead of just upvoting one of the other 99 reviews. Like, what do you think the upvote exists for? So, a... Yes. The, the updated list of all of the... Yes. Um, you know what? I think, actually. There we go. Okay, so. All of the Cronenberg that I've watched ranked worst to best, giving my love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether I love them all. The Brood, Cosmopolis, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, A History of Violence, A Dangerous Method, Existence, The Fly, and Videodrome. And this is when we get into the spoilers. So if you have not already watched it, or at least read the book or something, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, you, you can keep watching, but it's not going to make a lot of sense. I'm not going to explain context. The rest of the video is based on the idea that you have watched the movie. So, yes. Starting with notes taken while watching. So, yeah, from right away, in both book and movie, Eric is stubborn, arrogant, and demanding. Like, he's literally being told, you know, you're making, you're making other people's jobs much more difficult there is a better way to do this this is you're you're being extremely impractical you know Torvald lays out everything and Eric is like no you know fuck you I, I want what I want you know so yeah and Let's see, I guess if this were Elon, I it wouldn't be a limo, it would be a windowless tunnel that robs you of the any any joy. And let's see. Right, I like the detail that the limo is soundproof, although later it's said that, you know, technically isn't completely, so I don't know if that was just a decision made, or if that was an oversight, but the the fact you know the the door opens and you immediately hear the the noise of the city, and then the door closes again. He closes the door behind him, and you know I th there, it it cuts back out pretty soon after, but I'm pretty sure we just briefly stay. The camera stays in the car in the limo after he leaves. And we realize, you know, no, it really is completely, there's no, what's the word? Um, there is no sound inside the limo from outside. And yeah, so he goes to, into the, the car with, with his wife. And I will say, from what I recall, in the book it was clear before he opened the door that this is his wife. But... It might actually kind of work fine for them, you know, I, I don't know that, like I said, I think the book is better than the movie overall. I think it worked pretty well, the fact that, you know, like, f because the moment that it happened, I was like, now is this his wife or did they change something to make, you know, because when they started talking... I wasn't entirely sure, like, there was, there were a couple of seconds where I was not convinced that they were not complete strangers, that it wasn't just, you know, oh, she looks attractive, I want to I want to fuck her, you know, I'm going to get inside the, the cab that she's in, you know, because, like, she looks at him, and she's like, your eyes are blue, you know, that's the kind of thing you would say to a stranger, well, you would think, when, you know, you might not actually say it, but then that's dialogue in this movie, you know. But but no, not long after, you know, they, it becomes clear this is you know this is his wife. They are married. And I like you know he says the words. You know, so yeah, most of what I'm saying about like dialogue, you know, a big 
chunk of the, the props obviously goes to Don DeLillo since so much of it is verbatim. But yeah, you know, he says, let's talk about us. When are we going to have sex again? And it's the thing of, you know, there's that, there's that phrase, let's see, I think it goes something along the lines of, if the sex is good, it's 5% of the relationship. If the sex is bad, it's 95% of the relationship. So clearly, he is frustrated that they're not having more sex, even though he is already having sex with other women, you know, which she, you know, she can smell on him. But, no, that's not enough. He still wants to, to be, you know, yeah, to also be having more sex with her than she wants to, which, again, like, just really, really gross. And, and you know, he's, he thinks that what he wants, he should immediately get. And that's how most of his life has been. You know, he's, he's detached. You know, if, like, if you are in a monogamous relationship with someone, for one thing, you don't cheat on them. You know, if you, what I always say about, you know, if, if you feel a desire to, to be with someone else, you know, one option is to have a conversation with your partner, because if, if maybe you feel that they're not giving you as much tenderness and intimacy as you wish they did, you know, yeah, a conversation can make, you know, so a lot of situations the moment that you say that to your partner, they're going to be like, oh my god, I didn't realize. Thank you for telling me. I, you know, that's going to change right now, you know. You know, if, if you don't think that a conversation would go well, you know, maybe break up with them, but don't have sex with someone that you're not, you know, if, if you are in a monogamous relationship with someone, don't have sex with someone else until you've left that relationship. Or, you know, if you have a conversation with your partner and you decide to have an open relationship, that's also an option. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah. So, you know, obviously, don't cheat on your partner. And another thing, if you're in a monogamous relationship, you know, if you, like, obviously, the, the, it's different for asexuals. And, and, let's see, I think the term is aromantic. I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm trying to keep up. Um, I mean, no disrespect. You know, obviously it's different there, but it, I, I don't know that I, I don't really get the vibe off her that she is actually asexual. Just, you know, they're not that interested in each other, really. Like, he thinks that she's sexually attractive. And she kind of seems like she doesn't really, she doesn't really like what he does for a living. You know, so, but, but yeah, you know, the, if you are in a situation where your long-term monogamous partner, you know, isn't really, like, that interested in having sex with you, and you are, you know, instead of, like, pressuring that, your, your partner, which is what he does, you know, he just says, when are we going to have sex again? I want to have sex with you. We haven't had sex in like forever. When are we gonna have sex? You know, he's he's being really pushy and really unpleasant. You know, instead, like, you know, maybe have a conversation with her instead of just telling her what you think should happen. And and I yeah, the line, I like your mother. You have her breasts. Is is just is truly amazing. Just. And I love how, you know, it, it cuts to Torval, and he's like, oh my god, I fucking worked for this guy, can you believe this? Just, yeah. And... Let's see, then we... Yeah, yeah, afterwards, you know, they talk about, oh, you know, the, the president is, is going through... Which president? America's president. I thought there were better... Yeah. He's, he, you know, he wonders why people still target presidents like that. I like that, see, I, I'm afraid I, uh, the name, let's see, I guess maybe it's on, 
Wikipedia cast list. Um, let's see. So it right. I think it's the the systems analyst. You know he, you know yeah. They're you know talking about the the Yuan, and he barely even looks at Eric for for a lot of it. He keeps changing how he's he's sitting to, to you know and he's he's just looking at his little his little screen until they start talking about the rat as a unit of currency then there's an actual connection like it's a movie where people are usually talking at each other talking around each other more than talking with each other but the idea of a rat becoming a unit of currency that really gets the ah oh, yeah you know like and you'd have dead rats you'd have pregnant rats and the you know they talk about the the exchange rates and all this stuff and i quite like the 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 bit about you know so how old are you now that you're not the youngest and it smash cuts to to him having sex you know that's like because because yeah you know he feels old he at, at 28 he feels old and yeah they talk about the the weddings and the, you know two great fortunes coming together so Eric how's your sex life and yeah, they talk about, you know, the, the, she thing, you know, yeah, they're, they're talking about, you know, buying this painting, and he says, I want to buy the chapel, and she keeps saying, but that doesn't make sense, you can't, why, why is the painting not enough, you know, and it's this thing of, he wants it, when, why shouldn't he have something that's completely absurd, if he kind of feels like, you know, he doesn't even seem like, no, no, you don't understand. If I got this chapel, it would be amazing. No, it's just like, I don't know, can I want a chapel? Can we, can we buy a chapel? Can, is, that, is that doable? Because that's how, you know, these rich people, they get these ridiculous ideas in their heads. And then suddenly, you know, people that work for them have to move heaven and earth to accommodate these ridiculous things. There's like, you know, it's... If a child came up with this sort of thing, their parents would be like, oh, you, go play, you know. But because they are, you know, children in the bodies of adults who don't take no for an answer, suddenly, you know, other people have to accomplish these ridiculous things. And, yeah, he talks about, you know, he has multiple elevators, and he takes... A certain one for the for the music when he feels a certain way, you know, something like that. Just yeah. And let's see the yeah, and and you know, there's that bit about how you know the the they talk about you know, um, money doesn't doesn't really matter. You know, that's something that you only say when you have so much of it. That you can't even really tell how much. I mean, there's also that line about you know, oh the the uh, her uh, Elise you know, she has more money than can be estimated. It's, I know that's not verbatim, but it's something like that. You know, she has so much money that you can't really wrap your head around it, and that's how it is for some of these people. You know, it's it's ridiculous sums. You know, it, like, try wrapping your head around how much the U.S. spends on the military budget, you know, and then look at how ridiculously bloated it is, you know, so, so yeah, uh, again, like, the, the, you know, people who don't have absurd amounts of money, they notice when they've lost some but, yeah, you know, he barely, like, he keeps talking, throughout the entire movie, he's talking about, oh, you know, I'm losing a lot of money, I, I don't, you know, we never actually see, like, you know, even by the end, he's, 
he's never actually really not getting his way. You know, he even he's the one who chooses to go up and talk to to Benno, who you know, I I feel bad the character doesn't know this, but both IMDb and Wikipedia, and I guess the actual movie's ending credits, then, you know, they name him as Ben Eleven, you know, which is what he keeps asking to be called. And... Let's see... Yeah, I, I love that, you know, when, when, there's, when there's danger or, you know, he sees violence, Eric smiles. He feels something... Finally, you know, he's he's living this existence where nothing touches him. So when he witnesses the the this this North Korean, you know, stabbed on television, you know, he he witnesses this and he and he smiles. Just yeah. Very nice. And and I appreciate also again, you know, Robert Pattinson, he used to be thought of as, oh, you know, he's that handsome guy from Twilight. And then he does this movie where he's smiling creepily at a guy being stabbed in the eye. You know, just, yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty significant message of, I'm not the fucking Twilight guy, okay? Knock it off. You know, I want to be taken seriously. I'm willing to... to you know, risk flushing my career down the toilet by appearing in... You know, people have lost careers for less than this. And then we have the... Um, yeah, you know, she, um, let's see, her character, Vija Kinski. Right, um, not the biggest... Let's, let's see, she's played by Samantha Morton. Incredibly talented young woman, you know, the, given that the, the character is, like, Eastern European or something, I would have preferred if the role was given to someone who had that actual background to not, you know, take away work from them because they don't they have a harder time um, yeah the the um, there's a lot of roles they don't even get a chance to get so let's see you know like um would maybe my my first thought would be that the role could have been played by Olga Kurilenko she is two years younger than Samantha Morton, so you know, age wide, age wise, it fits. I really must need more sleep. Holy shit! But but yeah, you know, and and she, yeah. Anyway, um, she's Eastern European, and then we get the yeah. I I like the line, you know, it it can't, but it did, you know. And, yeah, they, they really, they're very uncomfortable about the fact that the doctor who shows up is not the one that they're, they're used to. You know, Torvald pushes his face up against the, the glass, and then, you know, the, is that where the, the glass rolls down? It's just, yeah, that was, that's also quite the image. And, yeah, you know, they, they question him, like they've caught a, an enemy spy or something, but... No, like, I, I don't know. The other doctor had to be called away. I guess it was a family emergency. They didn't tell me, you know. And... Yeah, we get the, the detail, you know. He gets a checkup every day, including the weekend. People die on the weekend. People die because it's the weekend. And... I, I don't... It's... The fact that this actually has a prostate check whilst talking money and making eye contact is is truly amazing. It just and and again, it it is this thing of like you know things happen. Like, can you imagine being her? You know, I I get he probably at this point is just 
just, you know, what, whatever, this is, this happens all the time kind of thing. But can you imagine being her and, and making eye contact with him, trying to focus on talking money whilst he's got his pants down and a doctor is examining his prostate? Like, it just, yeah. You know, but that's, it, it, again, I doubt that that kind of thing, that exact thing happens in real life. But rich people do do completely absurd things, you know. Was it Elon Musk who tried to bribe a woman into having sex with him by saying he would buy her a horse or something? It's just, like, who even thinks, what is she going to do with a horse? This is not, like, the Wild West or, you know, a, a kingdom hundreds of years ago. What is she going to do with a, a horse? She's probably just going to have to sell it on, like... You know, it's already creepy to be saying, I will pay you to have sex with me. You know, as far as I understand, they were like, let's see, were they working together? I don't think, like, as far as I know, it wasn't, she wasn't like a sex worker. Because at that point, it's just like, no, that's not a payment that makes sense. You know, you know, obviously, sex work is work. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, let's see. Pay a horse for us. Um... Oh, okay, yeah. The woman, per her friend's account, rode horses. But that is... To, yeah, yeah, and he exposed himself and touched her. That's right, yeah, she was a flight attendant. She was... She was working for him, and he's exposing himself, touching her, and offering to buy a horse. It's just... Yes, it's possible that she would have ridden the horse... But it's still just, it's such a fucking weird thing to do, even if you look away from the, you know, obviously it's not as bad. You know, if he had just offered money, that would still be extremely bad, but the the weirdness is the kind of, you know, you there's, there's other people, there's poor people doing bad, although, you know, you're much less like, they're much less likely to get away with it. No one should be able to get away with it, but, you know. The law is just different for, for rich people, sadly. That's something that we have to change. Now, the... Let's see. Did I? Oh, right. Holy shit, I took a lot of notes for this one. Okay, uh, let's... Uh, yeah, the... the um... Right, yeah, the, the, you know, there's the conversation about they're trying to construe the meaning of the pause. You know, he took a breath, and the world is is trying to to figure out what happened. You know, and and that again, that is the kind of absurd thing that happens when you're dealing with these, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. And let's see, then we have the. Yeah, the you know they talk about the the sexual tension, and yeah, yet again he talks to his wife about having sex, and I like you know she she does yeah. There's that thing about you know when let's see when he was a child he figured out how much his body would weigh on all the different planets of the Milky Way or something like that you know. And she points out, I like that, that suits you, the perfect meld of science and ego. And yeah, that really is Eric in a nutshell. And yeah, then we get the, the talk about the, the soundproofing not working, but it's just gesture, you know, and he, he says men like to, to do that. I don't know if that is true for all, but I do think that there is a certain sense that straight cis men, you know, we like gestures. And, you know, yeah, he talks about, oh, you know, the, the actual noise is not a problem. And he also talks about, you know, he was the reason why it didn't work. You know, he was like, you know, okay, now do this to my car. Okay, now soundproof it. And they're like, 
but soundproofing isn't going to work, you dipshit, is what they would like to be saying, because you did this other thing, it's like, eh, whatever, you know. So, so they wasted all this money and labor on a thing that doesn't work just because he couldn't pick one of the two, or just say, you know what, I don't mind the noise, you don't have to fucking soundproof my car, especially if it's not actually going to work. You know, I choose. I chose this other thing because that's how it works for people who are not rich. You know, we choose one or the other. You can't have everything, and that's an important part of life. And that's part of why they're so maladjusted, why they struggle so much, because people are constantly bending over backwards to give them everything they point to, every every little stupid thought that pops into their heads. You know, when the rest of us have stupid thoughts, we're just like, that's stupid. Never mind. We don't even say it to someone else. You know, but yeah, when when they're rich, they're just you know I don't know do do this, and then you know when when a thing doesn't work, they're like eh, eh, whatever, or they get mad at the people who told them that this would not actually work. You know, a lot of this also fits for for Donald Trump, who you know yes was a known entity in 2012, but you know since 2016, since the the presidential campaign and, and even fucking term he got, and here's hoping he doesn't get a second one, you know, yeah, he, there's a lot of people who weren't really thinking that much about Donald Trump before, who are now forced to, and, yeah, this, yeah, not sure there's a lot in this, not, not sure there's a lot about Eric Packer that wouldn't fit Trump, except except the fact that there are things Eric Packer does well. That's yeah. And then they let's see. Um, what on earth does that say? Oh, right, right. Yeah, the talk about going to a hotel to have sex. And, yeah, and then the the rat people come in, and he's, again, he's smiling because something's happening. This was unexpected. You know, oh, wow, they're throwing diseased animals at us. This is so exciting, you know, kind of thing. And just, yeah, you know, he, he really doesn't, yeah, he's, he's legitimately kind of annoyed that everything, you know, yeah, that that he's expected to, for things to to go, a very, you know, this this kind of yeah, making plans and and yeah, and yeah, there's the line about you know wealth for its own sake, which also quite a problem. Like I I can understand. I don't. I still don't approve, but I could at least understand people who are like, you know, what if tomorrow the, you know, the world falls apart? If I'm wealthy, I can protect myself kind of thing. But people who want wealth for its own sake, it's just, yeah, completely ridiculous. And, yeah, they talk about the relation between money and time, how it changes... And we get the, the rat riot. Yeah, I, I can't explain it, but the the visual of someone in a rat costume climbing on top of a car and the car, you know, starting to, to you know, I, I guess, un, like, under the weight, it, like, falls, you know. There's just something about that. I wish there was more like that in the movie. And also, you know, some of them are carrying around a rat, and I think that is actually, if I recall, that is described in, in the book as well. And they coldly analyze the emulation. You know, she's like, that's not very original. And there's there's others who've set themselves on fire. And he's like, just imagine the pain, though. You know, and it's like, fuck. You know, just like some of the things he says and some of his reactions, like if he wasn't so rich that there were constantly people around him, he might be a serial killer. Like, this is not, you know, just, yeah. 
and let's see. Yeah, and the, they talk about, you know, there's a credible threat on your life. Doesn't make him, you know, at, at that point, like, yeah, you'd go like, okay, you know what, let's, let's go home, let's go where it's completely safe. You know, there's no need for the, the, you know, like, like they said, you can have a haircut in the, you know, in the office. You can have a, you can bring a guy in, you know, and, and actually, you know, the fact, yeah, he, he wants to go to this particular place, which is in a bad part of town and it's, it's dangerous and such. Because, you know, I mean, he's essentially, he's like cosplaying as a poor person. You know, he's going to this, this really, you know, they, they talk about this is, this is dangerous place, this dangerous neighborhood, you know. Even the, the hairdresser has a gun just in the drawer. You know, he's not like, I think I have a gun around here somewhere. He's just like, okay, here, here, have this gun, you know. But yeah, he, and, and yeah, the guy, like, if he paid for the guy... You know, I mean, the, I think, uh, Anthony, if he paid for Anthony, you know, Anthony might lose some customers in the time it takes to, to travel back and forth. If you pay him money to make up for that, you know, and yeah, that, that's an option. But no, he, he wants to go to this bad neighborhood. Yeah. Um, see, yeah, and they talk about, you know, he bought an ex-Soviet plane, and, you know, you know, she's like, why, why did you buy it? And he's like, to look at. It's mine. You know, the, the, he is a character who needs nothing, but he wants things, and he just, you know, yeah, he expects to get what he wants. And the, again, this is true of so many rich people. There's so many rich people where they're like, they get an idea in their heads, and then it just has to be like that. You know, remember when Elon Musk, like, they were already working on, you know, no one went to him like, please help. No, they were already in the process of rescuing the these, Let's see, I, I honestly don't remember, let's see, what are most forms? The, the, yeah, the British diver, you know, yeah, the, they needed to, to rescue these, these guys from this Thai cave. And, yeah, you know, th yeah, they were already working on it. They, were, they had it under control. It's not, you know, and, and Musk is like, no, I'm going to solve it. Why? Why? It's being solved, you know, but it's just like he, he sees a thing and he's like, ooh, I, I, I have an idea. Okay, people have ideas. That doesn't mean you have to do it. You know, and he, and, and he designs this thing that, like, this British diver points out that, that wouldn't actually work, you know. And, and so Elon Musk calls him a pedo. It's just completely unhinged. It's, it's, yeah. Moving on. And let's see. Yeah. And, and during sex with, I think, the, uh, let's see, character Kendra, you know, they, they talk about percentage of body fat and, you know, yeah, risk. And, and she gets out the, the taser because he just wants to feel something. And let's see. Yeah, and, and then we, yeah, one more conversation, one more meeting with the wife. And we have the line, I think this is a conversation. You know, again, just such a, just, I love this, I love these lines. And yeah, you know, she, she realizes, oh, he, he lost a bunch of money. He's not rich anymore. I mean, I'll help you. Don't worry about that we can't be married anymore because you know the thing that mattered was that both of them had money that was that was the only reason that this made you know clearly they don't they don't feel that strongly about you know what one way or the other about the other one and let's see yeah at the party they talk about drugs and about how 
you know, oh, these young people are, are on drugs to, to kill the pain. And this guy, who's, I guess, like middle-aged or something, says, what pain could they have at their age? You know, which, you know, yet another example of someone not having empathy throughout, you know, this, this movie. These are characters who don't usually have, you know, yeah. But, but it's also this thing of, what the fuck have you experienced that even makes you think, you know, and it's it's one of these many things, you know, it's, I don't want to go, I appreciate that we have reached a point where a lot of people are saying, let's not do the anti-boomer shit anymore, and I really, like, there's a lot of boomers that I respect dearly, you know, so I'm 100% ready for, you know, I, let's see, was it, I think it was that dang dad who said, instead of okay boomer, go okay capitalist. You know. But with that said, I do think this is one of those cases of, like, a boomer who's like, ugh, these young people. You know, he, he can't imagine that they would, like, imagine saying that after the 2008, after, after the, 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 the ah, shit, what is this? What is it called again? The the stock market crash, I think it was, you know. Yeah, they have fucking pain. They lost so much. They they live they're growing up in deep economic insecurity, and he's like, what pain do they have? But yeah, it probably does also mean he's seen some shit. You know, not when he was young, but you know, in, in more recent times he's seen something horrible that you know, yeah, based on, you know, like, given his age, he's probably worked a number of different jobs where he's had to kill people. You know, he has the, there's that line about, you know, killing people is like lunch. And they talk about, you know, the identity of the killer doesn't matter. And that, you know, that persists at, at the end, you know, yeah, Eric doesn't really care about Benno. And, yeah, we're, we're told, you know, Brother Fez died today. And, you know, f the, the, yeah, the record company wanted to, to really milk it. And, you know, there's that line about, well, he, wa he wasn't shot. Is, is, that a, is that a letdown? And, let's see. Yeah, you have the thing about, you know, but it's it's a scandal. Everything's a scandal. It, a, a, you know, dying is a scandal, but we all do it all the time. And we have the thing about, you know, oh, Brother Fez, you know, he, he got a minaret built next to his house so he could live in it. He didn't, you know, he left his house to live in a minaret. Again, you know, this completely absurd. Do you realize how many unhoused individuals you could have provided a home for with the money that you used to build a second place for you to live next to the first just yeah and yeah the death of someone that Eric admires you know finally he feels something other than horny and yeah um Andre Petrescu pies him in the face. And then we get like this verbal manifesto. And I really like that the fact like the I like the fact that apparently those photographers were working for him. You know, he's you know, okay, come on, let's go. And without hesitation, like immediately they just follow him. You know, it's not that, oh, you know, the press was there and they wanted to take pictures. No, no, they, they were specifically there for for that. And I love the line, the whipped cream is irrelevant. And, yeah, um, Torvald's gun needs, you know, 
voice activation and Torval also has to say the specific word, which later Eric says to a different gun as, you know, yeah, as if that one needs it. And let's see, then we have, yeah, we, yeah, and he, he shoots Torval, you know, and he, he seems to feel nothing over it. He's not relieved, he's not like later when they're like oh it's dangerous to be here you know take this no it's it's just like you know whatever it you know this is this is a man who has dedicated all of his energy for for you know as long as he's been working for Eric trying to keep him alive and Eric shoots him without a second thought and yeah, and he, he pees in the limo, which has, like, a, a toilet come out and, and go back in. And, yeah, he meets back with, with Anthony to, to get... Anthony? Crap, I forget. Um, but, but, yeah. Yeah, I think it was Anthony. You know, and... and the, the... Yeah. You know, he's like, what, what food would you like? And, you know, yeah, he chooses the eggplant, which is very appropriate, because he's, he thinks with his eggplant. And, yeah, they bring in the, the driver, Ibrahim, and they talk about, you know, what it was like to be a cab driver. You know, you, you pee in the river, you pee in bushes, you stay in the car for 12 hours, you eat in the car. You know, a guy flew through my windshield, and I had to tell him, dude, you got to get out of there. I can't do my job if you're in, in my windshield. You know, completely unemotional. Just, they, they, it's, it's, there's no sense of, like, the weight of, of, you know, they don't seem bothered by the fact that someone flew through the windshield, other than, you know, this kind of impedes me at my ability to do my job. Could you, could you not? Again, a complete lack of, of empathy. And, and yeah, they talk about, you know, suddenly Ibrahim, you know, uh, where's, where's Torval? He's not here, I just noticed. And they talk about, you know, you need protection in this part of town. And he, he gets the gun, and not long after, he, he fires it. And again, we have this thing of, you know, someone shoots from, from the window, and instead of going in the other direction, he goes, he goes in, he, he tries to find the guy. And not only that, but he, even before he starts like shooting essentially like randomly, you know, he could have, he could have killed someone and it just doesn't, yeah. He honestly, he almost seems kind of excited to have a gun, to have some kind of, destructive power at his disposal and yeah so the book has a perspective switch I think it's here it's at least right around here to where we see some stuff from Benno's point of view that doesn't appear in the movie at all um, I will say it would probably have ended up making the the movie a little bit too long, but I do also think they could have done some visual stuff with it. I'm, I'm, was there much dialogue in the, because we get like, you know, in, in the movie, Benno has a few lines about, you know, oh, I couldn't keep up, you know, the, the stuff was moving too fast, so I started to hate it. In, in the book, we get a lot of details about Benno in, in relation to this, and I think yeah, I, it would have been largely visual with, with little, if any, dialogue. So, you know, might have been, might have been good to have. And let's see, then we have the, yeah, you know, the, the um, they talk about killing and, you know, he, yeah, he gives the fake name of Ben Eleven, and Eric immediately deduces. You know that is the thing. Like he is smart. The you know sometimes he really does see right through things. And 
you know, we have the line about, you know, Benno is like, I'm 41. Or did, did I turn 42? Why would I keep track of my age? You know, and that's, yeah, if, if you're not happy you're alive, you know, which, which I, I, I'm not sure if he outright says that, but you get that sense from him. You know, he later says that the only way for his life to have any meaning is if he kills Eric. So, yeah, you know, if you're not happy you're alive, why bother keeping track of your age? It's just a depressing reminder. And, yeah, I love the line, you know, whether it's imagined or not doesn't matter because it's real to me. And that's something that a lot of people who don't know anyone who ever hallucinates, they don't, they, they struggle to accept that, you know. And, let's see, yeah, they told me, you know, uh, uh, Eric points out his violence is an imitation, not original. And later says that Benno hasn't cared about anyone but himself. And, yeah, Benno admits it's not technically, Benno is not his real name, but he wants to be called it, and he gives some reasons for why he wants to kill Eric, some of which Eric calls bullshit on, apparently, with at least one of them, it's accurate, but it's bullshit. And, yeah, you know, Eric puts the gun in his own mouth, and, and you know, Benno's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I don't know. You know, and, and then he shoots his hand, like, it is this thing of just he wants to feel something fuck just just something you know sex isn't doing it food isn't doing it you know violence seems to do it you know at least you know he he was happy when he witnessed violence earlier it didn't seem to really phase him to shoot Torvald but maybe he'll feel good if, you know and he's felt so indestructible so yeah he him he shoots his hand and Benno points out, you know, the prostate was a, a sign and you, you misunderstood it or something along those lines. You know, you were looking for balance, not appreciating imperfections. I really love the, the long take of, you know, Benno behind the, the fact that it's not... Yeah, it's it's not cut up. It works really well. Now, I honestly don't remember if the... I'm going to real quick check. It might be in the... Hmm. Okay, it does not... Let's see. Uh, does I die in Cosmopolis? Um, right, so yeah, um, in the book, it is also ambiguous whether Eric is alive or dead at the very end, though Eric encourages Benno to kill him. And yeah, you know, in the movie also, we, we don't know, and that's also something that, you know, some people really really hated that about this film and I think the the I think it works I think it's the right choice for the the story I get why some people feel that it's um, uh, what's the word it's basically it leaves you without the Um, yeah, uh, you know, we, um, it's, we, we get, we're told very early that there's some danger connected with this entire situation, and then maybe at the halfway mark or so, we're told there's a credible threat to your life, you know, and the, the, Yeah, what's the word? 
Um, yeah, the the um, yeah, we don't get a clear answer to this, but I do think that is the the right. I think a, I do think that the the um, I wasn't quite as invested in the movie by the the end point as I was. I would say for two thirds of it, so the ending didn't quite have as much of an impact on me as it could have. Which, you know, it's this is not something I'm used to with Cronenberg movies. Usually, the ending hits me really, really hard. But I do think that is probably the only thing about it that I don't. Yeah, overall, I do love the ending. And those were my notes. So that brings us to the final section, notes taken before watching. So, yeah, um, Elise can smell sex on Eric. Or, as she puts it, you smell like food. Have you been fucking... And, right, so some stuff from the book, he, yeah, he struggles sleeping, he wants to fuck the woman on the video, as hated colleague Anthony Rapp is dying, and Rapp's death makes Eric feel more alive. Eric Chin and others analyze so much, they no longer live in the moment, they exist beyond time. He likes licking women's body parts, whether they want him to or not. Right after the doctor tells Eric his prostate is asymmetrical, about a third into the book, for several pages, and then it goes, Oh, that's right! That, we get a perspective change to Ben Eleven. That's right, yeah. Who is apparently standing over Eric's dead body, writing what we're reading. Even after killing him, he wants to keep talking with him. Eric is very observant and analytical, understanding patterns. He doesn't seem to really understand why people do what they do. He seems not unwilling, but incapable of actual empathy. The only things that seem to move him at all are his horniness, hunger, and a desire for something to happen that he hasn't expected. I don't think he really chose all this security. It was forced upon him because he makes a lot of money for the company, but he badly wants to experience something that is out of control, or at least out of his control, of the company's control. Let's see... Yeah, and in the book as well, he's... You know, when the rats are thrown inside the cafe, he's actually fascinated rather than scared, like all the other patrons appear to be. Eric is kind of happy that colleague Kaganovich is dead, though they had bonded. He likes watching Torval beat a security threat in the protest movement, though he, of course, doesn't want them to succeed. Maybe he himself would like to attack people and property. He likes that they reference the rat as currency. He does want to try to understand the self-emulator. Defends him to Kinski, who describes it unoriginal. Putting it, yeah, like in the movie, so he got the idea from Vietnamese monks. And the credible threat against Eric excites him. Elise is certain he cheated at the hotel. He tells Elise about the prostate, and she's concerned. Yeah, uh, in the book as well, only thing he cares about is the death of his favorite rapper. And yeah, Eric is exhilarated when he gets to hit the cream pie bandit. Yeah, and he shoots Torval. The basketball game stops, but no one else cares, even though the gun was loud. Maybe because it only fired once. You know, they... Yeah, people figure, well, they... they they really badly wanted to shoot that person. They shot him. I'm safe. They're okay. They're happy with how many people they've shot. He shot Torval because he resented the power Torval had over him as his security officer. No positive emotion for Torval. And almost right after we get a little more Benno. He, yeah, Eric remembers his dad taking him to get a haircut when Eric was a child. That's part of why he feels positive emotions for the particular place. And Eric likes that haircutter Anthony, hairdresser Anthony says the same thing each time he's there. About being dying, 
the same thing that killed his dad. Probably something that capitalism has done that affects poor people places. You know, he did, Eric doesn't feel empathy for him. He just likes that it's, yeah. And, yeah, he did actually hope the credible threat would come true, that he would be killed. He doesn't want a gun. He's upset the night is almost over. He thought he'd be killed right after Tor Torwall died. Oh, wow, I completely forgot. Yeah, there's a hundred naked people on the street for a film shoot. They're not sure why they're lying naked immobile for the film. Eric feels separate from them and is frustrated that he isn't one of them. After all the times she said no, Elise wants sex with Eric. He realizes he loves her. She disappears. And Benno threatens Eric but wants to talk. And Eric couldn't figure out the Yuan. That's why he tore everything down. An immature reaction. Eric is ready to die. He worries he'll die soon anyway. Benno admits his name isn't Benno, but Richard Sheets, but Eric doesn't recognize the name. He likes making people feel worthless. Eric at first refers to Benno as the subject in the narration, refusing to use either of his names. Keeps questioning why Benno is doing it, arguing against his reasons. Yeah, in the book as well, he shoots his own hand just to feel something. Eric tells Benno his prostate is asymmetrical. Benno responds, his is too, that it means nothing. It's not harmful. Eric feels relieved. And not long before this, he starts referring to Benno as Benno in narration. And and that's a thing. I, I, I don't know how they would have gotten that across, but it, it would have been nice if there was some visual indication that that changes how Eric feels about Benno. Benno assists, insists that he shoot Eric. Eric has a camera watch. It shows him dead before he is dead. He wishes he'd live on a computer, be mummified. He thinks about the funeral, the people he leaves behind, and it ends with him waiting for the shot. So, some critic quotes. Uh, one person said, Criticizes capitalism, but does not offer any alternative other than anarchism. I personally completely disagree that it's supposed to be read as suggesting that anarchism is an alternative to capitalism. The way I see it, the movie is saying unchecked capitalism will eventually spawn anarchism. As far as I can tell, we're supposed to think that anarchism is bad. I'm not going to be discussing the misunderstanding of anarchism in this video. Renegade Cut does a better job than I could. <clears throat> Let's see... Yeah, and, and one person, one, one user reviewer said, you know, who would insist on getting a haircut when things are so bad? He's endangering himself. Rich people do stupid, destructive, and self-destructive things all the time. You're, you're missing the point. You've, you've got it completely backwards. That's something that really works about it. I'm not, I'm not going to claim that everything works about the book or the movie, but the fact that he is, like, because that's the thing. He wouldn't get into all these circumstances if not for like almost everything he experiences that you know like being near the 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 riots you know that he could probably have avoided that if he stayed in the office if he got the haircut there but he specifically wants you know yeah wanted this thing and yeah the rest of us have to pay for terrible impulses by rich people and, and the fact that they can follow them. I'm not saying that other people don't also. The rest of us have, you know, bad ideas sometimes as well. And, you know, the, the thing, the big difference there is that rich people are supported in following their bad ideas. And, you know, people will do a lot to, to protect their ability to carry out these terrible things. And, yeah, so back to some critic and user review quotes. The deeper Eric gets into this environment, the further removed he becomes from his ivory tower and space station-like car. The more human he starts to appear, and Pattinson is excellent in the way he modulates his this gradual change in, change in his character. 
side of the film's ultimate antagonist, played by Paul Giamatti, comes into the film far too late to engage the viewer. Moreover, in a complete failure of casting, Giamatti's first appearance on screen is conspicuous. The role of Ben Eleven should have gone to complete unknown. When Paul Giamatti walks by the limo early in the film, he sticks out like a sore thumb. Amid all the pedestrians, I found myself exclaiming, hey, that's Paul Giamatti. And given that this is not an Edward Hitchcock film and Paul Giamatti is not assuming a Hitchcockian cameo, the viewers tipped off early and simply waiting through a particularly droll day for Giamatti to pop back up. 100% agree. That was, yeah, that was a mistake. And I, you know, I love Paul Giamatti. I, I love seeing him and stuff. He, he is incredibly talented at, you know, as a dramatic actor, as like in in comedy roles, you know, I've just but but this I was definitely a, a mistake. They should have gone for some unknown. And I think that is everything. So yeah, um, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that criticizes capitalism. And if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. Want you more links to stuff like relevant playlists, they suggest a video you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on uh, on a movie. And let's see, I also try to do a daily one on a Marvel show, which right now is season four of Agents of Shield. And let's see. I, right, and, and a weekly one where I talk about a, a horror thing. Right now, I am very early in Ash vs. Evil Dead. And let's see. The, yeah, I also try to do something, a Star Wars show that I haven't done already. I am working my way through the most recent episodes of Young Jedi Adventures right now, and recently reviewing thoughts videos to now not very similar to this one. In other words, if more of it is like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Keep those rats flying.